Uh, it's great to be here in Istanbul. Uh, as Errol mentioned, I had come here one time before earlier in the year and it was an amazing experience. And just like um, Errol and Morat said earlier, I really do believe that Istanbul is going to be a hub for innovation in this space. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, definitely seen a lot of talent around. I think more people are, are starting to come to this realization. The fact that there's even a proposal to have DevCon here next year is super, uh, super interesting. So hopefully that'll come to fruition. Um, but as Errol said, my name's Anthony. I work at Alio as head of growth. I've been at the company for about a year and a half. It's been a very interesting journey so far. I'm really looking forward to, to pushing the project forward. Um, I guess my talk today is not gonna be technical whatsoever. Uh, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not an engineer. I'm just like a biz dev guy. So if you're somebody that's like relatively new to the space and just trying to get your bearings about what the proper use cases are uh, for zero knowledge uh, tech, uh, this would be the talk for you. So I'm just gonna try to keep it as simple as possible so people can get the a general sense of where the real value is with this technology. Because a lot of times when I talk to folks, sometimes it's hard to connect the dots. Um, and I think the two speakers before me have done a pretty good job of giving some examples of how these things can work and I kind of just want to expand upon that. So actually maybe the first thing I'll do is uh, maybe I'll just give like a high level overview of Alio, like if people aren't familiar. So basically Alio is developing a layer one blockchain um, and we've developed an entire software stack to allow uh, web developers to build private applications on Web3. Um, and so essentially we have our own operating system, we have our own VM, our own blockchain like I just mentioned. Uh, we also have our own programming language called Leo, which actually lets you build with snarks. Um, so we abstract away all the complexity of doing that uh, so that you can basically just um, write, run, and deploy your application right out of the box. And we're gonna be launching our uh, final testnet um, in the coming week. Uh, so if you're interested in exploring that, definitely check it out. Uh, people will be able to uh, write and run programs and just get involved in the ecosystem. So one other thing that I want to uh, mention before I start this talk is um, when we talk about zero knowledge uh, proofs or like zero knowledge cryptography, there's kind of like two areas that people always talk about, right? One is scalability, using them for scalability, which our previous speakers had talked about. And then the other aspect is for privacy. Um, and to steal a quote from Errol actually, which I thought was really good, you can almost think about snarks or like these different implementations of zero knowledge as like wood, right? So it's basically a tool that you can use for a lot of different purposes. Just like with wood, I can construct a house with it. I could build a table, I could build a chair. These are all very different things, but at the end of the day, the core purpose of that tool um, is just, yeah, uh, universal. Uh, and so my talk is gonna be more focused on the privacy aspect of zero knowledge, not so much the scalability aspect, although obviously using uh, zero knowledge proofs for scalability is super valuable in this ecosystem. Um, and then also, uh, so going into the privacy discussion, like I just actually wanna get a show of hands, like how many people actually care about privacy? like in general. Okay, so most of the room, okay, that's good. Um, I, guess that's, uh, I guess that makes sense for this kind of a, a conference, but uh, when I talk to people on the street, right, if I just pulled somebody off the street and I said, do you care that like Google or Facebook or all these companies like have access to all of your data and information and like, you know, uh, your stuff's out there? Most of the time they're like, ah, I don't care because I get the convenience of being able to use Google Maps and like all these services and it, I'm not doing anything malicious so it doesn't really matter. Um, and that makes sense if you're thinking about it in the context of a Web 2 environment, right? And when we mean Web 2, we just mean the current iteration of the internet that we all know and love and use today, right? Where you have these centralized organizations and companies that basically provide these products and services for you to use. Um, but the problem is when we start talking about Web3, uh, privacy actually becomes much more important to think about. Um, and the reason for this is because um, even though there's a, a lack of privacy in Web2, right, because you're giving your information to these companies, there's even a larger lack of privacy in Web3, right? There's this big misconception that like uh, Web3 and these blockchain um, architectures are uh, private, privacy preserving. And, they're not, they're pseudonymous, right? So you have a wallet address, 
right? And maybe I can't tie that directly to you as a person, but I can basically see everything that you've done. Like I can, I can see like every transaction that you've made, like, you know, an interesting example would be like, let's say you're buying like a wedding gift for your spouse or something, right? You, maybe you like share your public keys with each other. You can see exactly like when they bought your gift, how much they spent on it, like all this information, right? Um, and not only that person can see it, but everybody on the ledger can see it. So it's like, do you really want your neighbor knowing like every single transaction that you're facilitating on the network? Probably not. And so when you actually look at it in the context of Web3 and you explain this, people are like, oh, okay, I understand. Like I actually should care a lot more about privacy because literally everything is going to be public knowledge. And then on top of that, right, with um, like namespaces, right, some people put like, you know, I, I know on the slide you presented was like Vitalik.eth or like people have these different um, uh, names that they associate with their their uh, public keys, you're even exposing yourself even more. So now we can directly trace it to you. Or if you use Coinbase, right? Like you have to KYC to use Coinbase and they generate the wallet address for you. So literally they know exactly who you are and your wallet address and you've basically lost all your privacy. So that's why it's really important to um, like actually care about these things. And then the last couple things I'll say about like the Web2 space is that I think an interesting thing was when we were developing the internet, um, I don't know if it was fully certain that privacy was going to be an issue, right? It, it was maybe hard to predict like how these different products and services would manifest themselves. And so privacy was never really at the forefront. It wasn't really maybe the, the primary uh, thing that people were trying to bake in. Whereas with Web3, uh, I think that's actually becoming more of the case, which is really beneficial. And then the other thing is that um, with all these businesses, they've established these private database business models, right? So the way that they're able to, to make money is uh, w without you having to pay for these services is by collecting all of your information. Um, and so with all these things combined, you already have that lack of privacy and it's only gonna get worse in Web3. Um, and yeah, so these are, yeah, I basically covered all of these, these points as well. Um, I guess maybe the last thing is that like, I think privacy will be absolutely like a necessary feature again for um, all of the points uh, that I mentioned. And again, the key takeaway is that in Web3, like your privacy is in fact going to be, um, you know, more at risk. Okay, so going into specific applications. So I think this is maybe the interesting uh, area for people. What I'm gonna really try to hone in, hone in on here is identity, right? When it comes to these um, applications using zero knowledge, right? So. In every case I'm gonna present, identity is going to be some core aspect of it. Uh, so the first one I wanna talk about is like zero knowledge authentication or like zero knowledge auth for short. Um, so easy way to conceptualize this is imagine being able to log into a website, but instead of providing like a username and password, you just provide a zero knowledge proof about some statement saying like, you know, I am the owner of this account, right? Like some of the examples uh, that were presented earlier. Because if you remember, like a zero knowledge proof is just a, a, a way to prove some statement without revealing a specific information. Um, and then uh, maybe some of you use like a product like one password, right? The problem with one password is that you're saving all this information in one centralized location. And if one password were to get, you know, hacked or corrupted or something, then you're going to run into major issues. Whereas if you're using a zero knowledge proof, even if something you know, did get corrupted on the site that you're logging into, all that the attacker is gonna get is the zero knowledge proof, right? They're not actually gonna get any information about you or your like password or anything like that. Um, and then this last point is actually really applicable for me. Like, I don't know if this has happened to other people, but sometimes you sign up for like a website because maybe you had to download an app or something and then you don't use it anymore and you just wanna like delete it and you wanna scrub your account. Sometimes it's really difficult. Like I've had to like, E like sometimes you have to send an email or you have to call them or you have to do like all these hoops just to like, you know, eliminate your account. But again, if you were able to log in with a zero knowledge proof, you wouldn't even need to do that, right? Because it's like, there's nothing for them to, you know, like collect about you. Um, so I thought that was like a really interesting feature. And it's kind of cool because I think it's Sweden is doing something like this, not with zero knowledge, but basically if I, Remember correctly, it's like you establish your identity through like your bank in Sweden and then you use that um, like uh, representation of yourself as like a, a generic um, 
like uh, you know uh, proof of identity for like various different services. So you can think about this as kind of the same thing, but instead of going through like a central bank to conduct uh, all of this, all these processes to prove who you say you are, you can do that all cryptographically through a zero knowledge proof and use that as your universal login. Uh, so that's kind of like the, the first interesting example that I wanted to present. Uh, the second one, so everybody here is probably familiar with the term DeFi, decentralized finance. Well, I'm here to tell you the next wave is gonna be ZFi zero knowledge finance. Um, and basically, all this means is we're, we're taking like all these really cool concepts that people have developed in DeFi, but adding zero knowledge, uh, a zero knowledge layer to it, right? So you can actually get more privacy. Um, one area that a lot of people talk about, and you know, specifically at Alio that we're working on, is trying to leverage this sort of thing to prevent things like MEV and front running. Um, now again, you can get into debates with people about this because some people say it's necessary to have a certain amount of like MEV in these ecosystems. Some people say you shouldn't have it all, but in general, it is possible to sort of eliminate some of these problems. Um, and then the other main thing is that when we're talking about financial data and information, typically it's extremely sensitive for most people, right? Like if you go, like, again, if I, in, in, in the current world, if I send you money and you give me your bank account number, I don't know anything about like, I don't know how much money you make. I don't know like where you're spending your money or anything like that. But again, if I, like I was saying earlier, if I give you my wallet address, I know like everything about you, right? And I think if we wanna get mainstream adoption, we're gonna need to come to a place where we can sort of replicate this kind of um, privacy that you would get in like the modern context in uh, this like Web3 DeFi context. Um, Another interesting example would be, and so going back to the identity case, like let's say you wanted to trade like on-chain derivatives or something, right? And we need to assess your creditworthiness. Uh, you could actually do this without having to reveal like all this personal data and financial information about the person that wants to, to make a, a, a trade, right? Because all we need to know is do you meet a certain credit score threshold? And again, that could be represented as a zero knowledge proof. So I think that's like another interesting application that applies to like identity plus uh, this DeFi application. Um, and then again, just in general, you're, you're essentially avoiding having to put your sensitive uh, info at any risk, which I think is like really important for, for most people. Uh, and then the last use case I wanna talk about is uh, zero knowledge non-fungible tokens or ZK NFTs. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with NFTs, right? It was like the, sort of the most recent boom in the space. Um, you know, I think one of the unique aspects of N NFTs in general is that they were able to attest ownership to some unique uh, item, right? Uh, which is why they're called like non-fungible tokens, obviously. Um, and that's really cool, but again, like, Let's say, for example, you are buying like an art piece that's represented as an NFT as like an investment, right? People have done this for you know, hundreds of years, right? Like putting money into art and things like this. And many times you don't actually know who the buyer is, right? Like it's, it's, it's anonymous. But again, in this case, in the current ecosystem, it will be fully public. So maybe you would wanna have a ZK NFT so that you know, we can say that, okay, this piece of art is in fact owned by somebody, but we don't know exactly who it is, right? Because again, we're talking about somebody's like sensitive financial information um, or like property, right? Like let's say you wanted to have some on-chain registry of like property in some location, let's say Istanbul, and we want to say that like, okay, these properties are owned by somebody or being rented or whatever. Maybe you don't want to put your name on that because if somebody is able to associate your public key and they, they know your permanent residence, and they don't like you for some reason, they could you know, break down your door and, and do some bad stuff, right? So again, if, if you could basically um, add zero knowledge to that, you could avoid these sorts of issues. Uh, maybe a more funny, funny one would be like, you know, if you bought something embarrassing like five years ago, like some crazy, I don't know, weird NFT, and it's like, oh, I don't want people to know that I actually like bought that before. If it was you know, ZK enabled, then nobody would have to know, right? Like you could just forget about it and not need to worry. Again, I remember like, I, you know, I guess a similar case is I set up a Facebook account in like the sixth grade uh, and I went back like years later when I was in college and I was like, holy crap, like there is so much weird, crazy shit on here that I, I don't know why I was like posting, it was like deleting everything. But again, like if it was, yeah, if there was some way to not even have to worry about that, it would have been 
a lot better and I would have saved a lot of time. Um, and again, just in general, like all we're doing here is really like enhancing these uh, existing properties of NFTs uh, that have been so you know, valuable for people. Um, so yeah, those were like the main examples I had. Uh, I have about like nine minutes left, so I'm not sure if we want to take questions, but yeah, we Yeah, so I think the aspect of it that would be considered private is like the ownership piece. So it's like, um, like, I guess, information about the person that like actually owns that NFT. So um, yeah, maybe it's even just like anonymizing the person's wallet address. So it's like, okay, we know it's owned, it's like legally possessed by somebody. Um, but one thing, so maybe one thing I should mention, and like this is something Ailey was also working on, I think is becoming more commonplace, is designing these systems to be private by default which basically means like every transaction that's facilitated is completely private and then you as an end user or you as an application developer, like when you're writing a program, can actually determine what information is revealed or what information is not, right? So in this case, it's like, okay, maybe we will, like for the property example, it's like we'll reveal like certain information about like is it a twin home, like general location, stuff like that. Maybe we don't put like the full address or something like that, right? Because if you've ever gone to a website like Zillow, that's usually how it works until you actually start like renting the place or, or talking with um, the person who's managing the property, then you get more specific details, right? But again, in the current system, everything would just have to be public by default. We kind of want to make it the opposite. So that's sort of, yeah, maybe how you can, can think about it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Just to add in on the private NFT aspects, I think right now you kind of think of NFTs as a, pub, as a public item, you don't kind of think about the ways to use them in which they would be private. Um, so for example, you could uh, you know, have house ownership or car ownership, or it could just be a reservation at a restaurant. Like if an, you could have an NFT to book a place at a restaurant next week at 9 p.m. in a certain place, and you wouldn't want any of that to be public. You wouldn't want it to be associated, oh, I know he's going to this restaurant at 9 p.m., I know the kinds of places he visits. So as you add in private NFTs, you can start to open up the space uh, of possibilities any other questions? Quick one. You mentioned identity. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if, if Elio has thought about uh, how you do identity in the context of incentives. So say uh, you're offering some incentive and you want to ensure that people uh, don't create multiple identities in order to get access to an incentive. Is this something that you guys have explored at all? Yeah, so we actually are working with, so there was a, a, um, a team that built uh, like this verifiable credentials project through our grants program called Spruce. I don't know if people have heard of them. If you haven't, you should check them out. They're a really cool team. Um, but they were trying to like work on stuff like this and like actually trying to create like these um, uh, unique like anonymized uh, yeah, identities like in our Discord channel, for example, um, for like different kinds of like programs that we were gonna run through our community. So yeah, it's definitely something we've looked into and I think it for sure could be like a super powerful application. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it for questions for now. Thank you very much. We're gonna have a half an hour coffee break and then we'll be back in here for the, for the next three talks. Okay. Thanks.